Namali Sarpel, Chip Delaney, to everyone watching this online, welcome to the Italian Academy at Columbia University. The Italian Academy is a premier global center for research in the humanities and sciences, founded in 1991 on the basis of an agreement between Columbia University and the Republic of Italy. Its chief commitment is to promote groundbreaking cross-disciplinary work while addressing international social issues. Located in Harlem, the Italian Academy is an intellectual and cultural resource with online and now finally a return to in-person events. We're at the Italian Academy right now, open to the public on a wide array of themes each year. For this event, the Italian Academy has partnered with Carnegie Hall to contribute to its ongoing Afrofuturism festival this spring. This evening, the focus is on the literary speculative fiction by two of America's finest writers, Namali Sarpel, author of the award-winning novel, The Old Drift, and Samuel R. Delaney, known to all as Chip, author of Dahlgren, Nova, and many other celebrated novels, memoirs, and collections of criticism. I'm Smaran Dayal, a public humanities fellow at the Museum of the City of New York, and a PhD candidate in comparative literature at New York University, where I'm writing a dissertation on literary Afrofuturism. My work inquires into the ways Chip and his one-time student Octavia Butler's fiction engages themes of colonialism, indigeneity, race, and slavery through the specific genre conventions and modes of science fiction. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce them with longer bi uh, bios before we transition um, first into a reading of um, Namali Serpel's short story, Company, a rewriting of uh, Beckett's story of the same name, and then an excerpt from uh, Chip's radio play, The Star Pit. <clears throat> In 2016, Samuel R. Delaney was inducted into the New York State Writers Hall of Fame. He's the author of the award-winning novels, Babel 17 and Dark Reflections, um, as well as Nova, Dahlgren, and the Return to Nevrion series. A retired professor, he lives in Philadelphia with his partner, Dennis. Zambian American writer Namali Sarpel's novel, The Old Drift, received numerous awards, including the Annisfield Wolf Book Prize for fiction that, quote, confronts racism and explores diversity, close quotes. The Arthur C. Clarke Award for science fiction, the Grand Prix, the Associations Littéraires Prize for Belles Lettres, and the LA Times' Art Zeidenbaum Award for first fiction. She was co-recipient of the 2020 Win Wyndham Campbell Prize for Fiction with Yi Yun Li. She's a professor of English at Harvard University and her second novel, The Furrows, will be published this September. We're gonna begin with um, Namwali's reading. Thank you. Thank you so much, Smaran, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you to the Italian Academy for having us. And thank you so much to Chip for doing this event with me. I'm, I have been for a long time a very big fan of your work. And so I'm very excited to talk uh, about Afrofuturism with you today. The story I'm reading is called Company. And it is a cover, the way you would cover a song, of Samuel Beckett's novella of the same title, Company, but it is my black science fiction revision of that short story. The story includes about 40% of, of Beckett's words intertwined with mine uh, to tell the story. So I'm just gonna read, um, I've rearranged it somewhat. Um, it is not as temporally chronological as the reading I'm about to give in its um, original form, but hopefully this will give you a sense of, of the story as it unfolds. We first saw the light on such and such a day. They told us it was coming, that we had not something loose from the sky. We suspected as much already after centuries of medicine, of wanting life, 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 there were too many of us, too much survival. A genomic combination coincided with the greatest advances in medicine, leading to an unprecedented boom in population growth. What a healthy baby, 10 fingers and 10 toes, 10 million billion fingers and toes. Another still, another of that other, yet another countless others. 
the ever-changing sum of those gone before, 25,070 billion, the ever-mounting sum, so many to add to yesterdays, to yestermonths, to yesteryears. All of the structures we had built to separate our bodies, all of that reaching up and out we had done, all of that collapsed with the brightening, the brightening, the day the sun stepped closer. The brightening happened one cloudless May day. They were at the swimming pool, his great grandmother and her sister. This was before he was born, before his mother and his grandmother were born. His great grandmother and her sister were still young girls then, bold in their neon swimwear. The water was a paler blue against the pale blue sky. They lay on their backs, tossing in their warmth, tossing words and laughter around, looking up at the pale blue sky and then at her sister's face, his great grandmother broke the silence, asking if that sky was not in reality more distant than it appeared. Her sister replied with a detailed prayer to God to bless all they loved. They dozed and did not notice when the sun spread to the edges of the horizon, brightness filling the sky like milk in a bowl. When they woke, everyone else was crouched under something. Everyone white clung to the shade. Some of those bodies moaning and steaming. Shadowless sky above, the two girls looked over the dazzling land, straining to see across the blinding pool water, away across the expanse of light. Their eyes ached. His great-grandmother looked at her sister and asked, are you all right? Her sister said, I'm just fine. God is good. God is love. She wiped her fingers across her forehead, bursting a small cluster of blisters there. When first the brightening came, white skin grew tattered and hung like lace from the body and the world smelled of thin singed hair. When the brightening came, black folk cackled at their own casual blisters. When the brightening came, only the darkest survived. Tanning beds became beds. Melanin became more valuable than any currency. It became the center of the stock market, the heart of the economy. Melanin was extracted and bought and sold and transfused. It turned out to be temporary. If you weren't born with it, it faded under the ultraviolet like everything else. Skins burned slowly under the calamitous sky. Soon the night sky was the reverse of itself. Instead of pinpricks in darkness, there were sooty spots in the general white. In the day, a mass of twisty clouds, the color of ash. Above, glass towers protecting the rich from the ultraviolet light that still poured through the murk. Below, the crowd. No space between us, a roiling of limbs across the land like the uneven weave of a carpet. To eat, a river of pap oozing daily on the hour, just close enough to reach with a hand, just about separate from the river of shit. He grew up in the West, he grew up in the crowd on his back, dark-skinned, lucky, a descendant of those who had the evolutionary advantage when the brightening came, but not the material advantage. Roll as he might, there was no other choice but to be prone or huddled with his legs drawn up within the semicircle of his arms and his head on his knees, fumbling, half blind, always with his mother. She stooped, cradling him from behind, or both lying on their sides at full stretch, face to face, their knees meeting, the hairs of their heads mingling. She found a way to make sure he knew her always, a red triangle of cloth, her right breast slung in it. His eyes opened and closed, looked in hers, looking in his, eyes in each other's eyes. He pressed his little nose against the rose red pane of cloth and all became rosy. He remembers the feel of her lips on his ear. His mother spoke all her knowledge into him her voice a hot rush into his ear in the midst of the great murmur of the crowd. All the little that he knows of the world as it is and was before is colored by the sound of her voice. They stirred together, shifted and shuffled, and they shared between them any scraps other than Pat. One day she was gone and he didn't know if it was death. And so he went on a notion to stir, stirring now and then to turn on his side, on his face, and some days he would roll or be rolled on his back and enough, if enough time had passed, he would open his eye crack and see cloud, the waxen cope of sky. He sometimes caught a flash of blue and across it a bird once flew. It's passing a wonder. It was the miracle of his life until the day he was recruited for the company. The time travel ship 
is akin to an air bubble floating between tightly compressed strata of time. The first trip back in time seems to take no time at all. Lila hands him a pill and tells him to lie down on a ledge built into the wall. Sleep, she says, settling onto her ledge across from his, her feet dangling. She turns toward a diamond deep pane and speaks into it. At 60 seconds and at 30 seconds, shadow hidden by hand from 60 to 30, shadow proceeds hand at a distance increasing from zero at 60 to maximum of 15 and thence decreasing to new zero at 30. Seemingly endless parallel rotation around the dial and other variables and constants brought to light and errors if any corrected. She turns back to him and smiles a quarter smile and they grasp hands loosely in the gap between the ledges. This sparks the engines. The ship hums up its scale and the walls ripple, the grids of light in its skin pulsing like rain in the wind. He takes the pill and closes his eyes. A voice comes to him in the dark. We're here, Lila says, her voice as groggy as he feels. He opens his eyes. She is standing, tapping at a wall in her mechanical way, sending numbers galaxying over it. Suit up, she says over her shoulder. He approaches the transparent great coat hanging beside his ledge. When he reaches for it, it flinches, then inclines shyly toward him. He enters the coat inch by inch, easing in as if it's a pool of water. Goosebumps rise as it creeps cool and liquidy over his fingers, but the coat soon adjusts to his temperature, his shoulders warm by the time it has covered his wrists. At the wall, he leans forward with bowed head, his eyes closed, making ready to set out. Lila's hand slides up the back of his skull to cradle his, Lila's hand slides up the back of his neck to cradle his skull. This is soon replaced by the familiar vacuum of panic as the encompassing surface of the wall presses into his nostrils. He shudders, then there's a soft ripping and he can breathe. The wall slips over his eyelids. Just let them open, she says. When you're ready, in any case, farewell. Her grip tightens on his scalp and she tilts his head forward and shoves him outside the time travel ship. The hoods of his eyes lift and bare his corneas. Brightness flares then dulls to a lemony light. The low sun shines on him from the east, flings his shadow all along the ground. Trees in the distance serrate the edge where earth meets sky. His ears pop and sounds clamor suddenly. Birds screech like weapons, wind scrapes by. He shakes his head and blinks. All of this is new. He is to maintain eyes and ears at a high level of alertness for any clue, however small, to the nature of this place, of this time. He sees a trail, so he turns right and advances southward. He covers the ground, feet unerring. After some hundred paces, another sound, the choppy melody of people talking, a spotty version of the crowd's murmur. What language? Bantu? Verse? He sees a group of dark-skinned men and women in the distance. He feels a surge of success. He has accomplished his first task, find melanin. The villagers are coming toward him in a beeline. They carry hunting gear over their round shoulders and in their strong hands. One leans on a long staff, another carries an instrument. A lute? What year is it? They meander closer, involved in their talk, uninterrupted. When they reach him, there is a swerve, a deliberate veer. They, didn't, they don't see him. They swarm around him unconsciously, like he's a tree in their path. A bird, black, hook-winged, swoops an arc over him. Miracle. He smi his smile widens and expands down his body as if opening the front of him. And now he runs past the villagers through them, barely feeling the breeze stirred by his great coat or the press of the ground against the bones of his feet. When he stops, his face is wet and he is inside an enclosure of rustic hexahedrons made of logs. The light is thicker now, shadows seeping back into the things that cast them. The wind is gone, the bird song softer, and he hears an odd sound. It is a rhythmic thudding, a kind of labor. He moves toward it, skirting the edge of a hut and turns the corner. A pale white creature covered in a thin layer of hair crouches on the ground facing away from him. He creeps closer and he sees that it is tied to a tree by a dirty rope around its neck. The thudding stops and the knobs in the creature's back spin as it twists and fixes him. A man. Elbows and knees angled, feet splayed 90 degrees. The open mouth is a cave in a craggy rock face, the straggling gray mustache like sparse shrubbery. Searching eyes, a hunted look in the round, cankerous face. The man turns back around, the thudding resumes. 
or maybe that's his own quickening pulse. Unlike the villagers, this white man seems to sense his presence. He tiptoes around to see him more clearly. The man is beating at a sack with a thick stick. His hands are tight on the stick, his brow tight with concentration, but all else is slack. Jaws, eyes, even the genitals, which sweep useless in the dust as he beats and mutters, beats and mutters, a single word, pound, 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 pound. Whatever is inside the sack grows wetter as it flattens. A dog barks. The villagers are approaching, bringing with them chatter and clatter and a smoky smell. The man pauses his work and curls his body over his sack. The villagers swarm around them both, but while they sidestep his invisible form again, several of them knock into the tethered white man, one so forcefully that he tips over into the dust. Quick, leave him. Why do we have to go back? He asks Lila in one of the pauses between his gushes of vomit, a side effect of re-entering the ship. He pants with the throb and thrust of puking. I do not know who that white man is. Lila gives him a sidelong glance, a trace of emotion in her voice. Her black eyes and hair flash as she paces, signs of distress. He might be the officer we lost on the last mission from A to Z or from another mission from the North. It could be Hodgkin, Percival, Pot, H, Coot, Haddon, Dante, I do not know. It can be verified, but it's too soon to say. Either way, he is not supposed to be here. He is a contaminant. Contaminant, he spits. Think about it. You and I are here to harvest pigment. If that man has inseminated even one source of melanin, finding pure stem cells will be impossible. She taps at a wall, her eyes skittering, pinpricked by the shifting constellation. We have to go back to our origin point, she repeats. The mission is over. Her panic manifests as a kind of thresher, chopping up her words and emotions. They seem logical, just smaller and faster. She points him to his ledge and leans over him. He feels on his face the ends of her long black hair stirring in the still air. She orders his mouth open, places a sleeping pill inside, and lies on her ledge, opposite. He swallows and shuts his eyes. Their hands reach out for each other, clench, unclench, to start the ship. When he wakes, she is kneeling beside him, eyes wet and worried. They are back where they came from. What will the company do? They suit up and move to a wall and halt with bowed heads, bowed heads at, on the verge of it. Then they grasp hands to ignite the grid and Lila dives forward with enough force to expel them both. Moonless, starless night, a roaring all around. By the time he opens his eyes, his feet have turned to cinder. There is no pain. He looks over at Lila's feet, black and furred. He thinks for a moment that this is the true color and texture of her skin. It is the first time he's been outside the time travel ship with her. Something crispy and light and dry scurries between their loosely clasped palms. He looks up and feels a terrible scratching against his corneas. He can barely make out the black bits whirring around like scraps of burnt wood. The wind dies. Together, the black bits come to rest, an immense twitching lake cloaking everything, millions of them tessellated, their wings and eyes iridescent as an oil slick. Flies, he says, and just as he opens his mouth, they rise. Thank you so much for that reading, Namali. We're now going to turn to an excerpt of the 1967 WBAI broadcast of Chip's Star Pit. The narrator is played by Chip himself, um, and the video text that you'll see was prepared by Rick Whitaker. Thank you so much. Two glass panes with dirt in between and little tunnels from cell to cell. When I was a kid, I had an ant colony. But once, some of our four to six year olds built in a collegarium with six foot plastic panels and grooved aluminum bars to hold corners and top down. They put it out on the sand. There was a mud puddle against one wall so you could see what was going on underwater. Sometimes, segment worms crawling through the reddish earth hit the sides so their tunnels were visible for a few inches. In hot weather, the inside of the plastic got coated with mist and droplets. The small round leaves on the litmus vines changed from blue to pink, blue to pink as clouds crossed the sky and the pH of the photosensitive soil shifted slightly. The kids would run out before dawn and belly down naked on the cool sand with their chins on the backs of their hands and stare in the half dark till the red mill wheel of Sigma lifted over the bloody sea. 
The sand was blue moon then, and the flowers of the crystal plants looked like rubies in the dim light of the giant sun. Up the beach, the jungle would start to whisper, while somewhere an annie ward would start wobbling. The kids would giggle and poke each other and crowd closer. Then, Sigma Prime, the second member of the binary, would flare like thermite on the water, and crimson clouds would bleach from Carl through Peach to foam. The kids, half on top of each other, lay now like a pile of copper ingots with sun streaks in their hair. Even on little Antony, my oldest, whose hair was black and curly like bubbling oil, like his mother's. The down on the small of his two-year-old back was a white haze across the copper, if you looked that close to see. More children came to squat and lean on their knees or kneel with their noses an inch from the walls to watch like young magicians as things were born, grew, matured, and other things were born. Enchanted at their own construction, they stared at the miracles in their live museum. A small red sea lay camouflaged in the silt by the lake puddle. One evening, as White Sigma Prime left the sky violet, it broke open into a brown larva as long and of the same color as the first joint of Antony's thumb. It flipped and swirled in the mud a couple of days, then crawled to the first branch of the nearest crystal plant to hang exhausted, head down from the tip. The brown flesh hardened, thickened, grew black, shiny. Then, one morning, the children saw the onyx chrysalis crack, and by second dawn, there was an emerald-eyed flying lizard buzzing at the plastic panels. creature butting the corner for a few days, then settled at last to crawling around the broad leaves of the miniature shade palms. When the season grew cool, and there was the annual debate over whether the kids should put tunics on, they never stayed in them for more than 20 minutes anyway, the jewels of the crystal plant misted, their facets coarsened, and they fell like gravel. There were little four cup sloths too, big as a six-year-old's fist. Most of the time, they pressed their velvety bodies against the wall and stared longingly across the sand with their retractable eye clusters. Then, two of them swelled for about three weeks. We thought at first it was some bloating infection, but one evening, there were a couple of litters of white, velvet balls half hidden by the low leaves of the shade palms. The parents were occupied now and didn't pine to get out. There was a rock half in and half out of the puddle, I remember, covered with what I'd always called mustard moss when I saw it in the wild. Once it put out a brush of white hairs, and one afternoon the children ran to collect all the adults they could drag over. Oh, look, Dad! 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 The hairs had detached themselves and were walking around the water's edge, turning end over end along the soft soil. I had to leave for work in a few minutes and haul some spare drive parts out to Tau Chetty. But when I got back five days later, the hairs had taken root, thickened, and were already putting out the small, round leaves of litmus vines. Among the new shoots, lying on her back, claws curled over her wrinkled belly, eyes cataract like the foggy jewels of the crystal plant she dropped her wings like cellophane days ago, was the flying lizard. Her pearl throat still pulsed, but as I watched, it stopped. Before she died, however, she had managed to deposit, nearly camouflaged in the silk by the puddle, a scattering of red seeds. I remember getting home from another job where I'd been doing the maintenance on the shuttle boats for a crew putting up a ring station to circle a planet that was itself circling Aldebaran. I was gone a long time on that one. When I left the landing complex and wandered out toward the tall weeds at the edge of the beach, I still didn't see anybody. Which was just as well because the night before I'd put on a real winner with the crew to celebrate the completion of the station. That morning I'd taken a couple of more drinks at the landing bar to undo last night's damage. Never works. The swish of frond on frond was like clashed rasps. The sun on the sand reached out two fingers of pure glare and tried to gouge my eyes. I was glad the home compound was deserted because the kids would have asked questions I didn't want to answer. The adults wouldn't say anything, which was harder to answer than questions. Then, down by the ecologarium, a child screeched and screeched again. Then Antony came hurtling toward me, half running, half on all fours, and flung himself on my leg. Oh, da, da. Why, oh, why, da? I kicked my boots off and shrugged my shirt back at the compound porch, but I still had my overalls on. Antony had two fists full of my pants leg and wouldn't let go. Hey, kid boy, what's the matter? 
When I finally got him on my shoulder, he butted his blubber wet face against my collarbone. <laughs> Crazy kid boy, tell Dad. Anthony held my ear and cried while I walked down to the plastic enclosure. They put a small door in one wall and a two-number combination lock that was supposed to keep this sort of thing from happening. I guess Anthony learned the combination from watching the older kids, or maybe he just figured it out. One of the young sloths had climbed out and wandered across the sand about three feet. See, Dad, it crazy. It bit me. Bit me, Dad. Sobs became sniffles as he showed me a puffy, bluish place on his wrist, centered on which was a tiny crescent of pinpricks. Then he pointed jerkily to the creature. It was shivering, and bloody froth sputtered from its lip flaps. All the while it was digging futilely at the sand with its clumsy cups, eyes retracted. Now it fell over, kicked, tried to right itself, breath going like a flutter valve. Can't take the heat. I reached down to pick it up. It snapped at me, and I jerked back. Sunstroke, kid boy. Yeah, it is crazy. Suddenly it opened its mouth wide, let out all its air, and didn't take in any more. It's all right now. Two more of the baby sloths were at the door, front cups over the sill, staring with bright black eyes. I pushed them back with a piece of seashell and closed the door. Antony kept looking at the white fur ball on the sand. I'm crazy now. It's dead. Dead because it went outside, Doc? Mm-hmm. I'm crazy? He made a fist and ground something already soft and wet around his upper lip. I decided to change the subject, which was already too close to something I didn't like to think about. Who's been taking care of you anyway? You're a mess, kid boy. Let's go and fix up that arm. I shouldn't leave a fellow your age all by himself. We started back to the compound. Those bites infect easily, and this one was swelling. Why it go crazy? Why it die when it go outside, Doc? Can't take the light. We reached the jungle. There are animals that live in shadow most of the time. The plastic cuts out the ultraviolet rays, just like the leaves that shade them when they run loose in the jungle. Sigma Prime's high on ultraviolet. That's why you're so good-looking, kid boy. I think your ma told me their nervous systems are on the surface, all that fuzz. Under the ultraviolet, the enzymes break down so quickly that... Does all this mean anything to you? Uh-huh. He admired his bite while we walked. Wouldn't it be nice, Doc, if some of them could go outside? Just a few. That stopped me. There were sunspots on his blue-black hair. Franz reflected faint green on his brown cheek. He was grinning, little and wonderful. Something that had been anger in me a lot of times momentarily melted to raging tenderness, whirling about him like the dust in the light striking down at my shoulders, raging to protect my son. I don't know about that, kid boy. Why not? It might be pretty bad for the ones who had to stay inside. I mean, after a while. Why? I started walking again. Come on, let's fix your arm up and get you cleaned. I washed the wet stuff off his face and scraped the dry stuff from beneath it, which had been there at least two days. Then I got some antibiotic into him. You smell funny, Dad. Never mind how I smell. Let's go outside again. I put down a cup of black coffee too fast, and it and my hangover had a fight in my stomach. I tried to ignore it and do a little looking around, but I still couldn't find anybody. That got me mad. I mean, he's independent, sure, he's mine, but he's still only two. Back on the beach, we buried the dead sloth in the sand. Then I pointed out the new, glittering stalks of the tiny crystal plants. At the bottom of the pond, in the jellied mass of any wart eggs, you could see the tadpole forms quivering already. An orange-fringed shelf fungus had sprouted nearly eight inches since it had been just a few black spores on a pile of dead leaves a few weeks back. Grow up. Anthony leaned nose and fists against the plastic. Everything grow up. And up. That's right. I grow. You sure as hell do. You grow? Then he shook his head, twice, once to say no, and the second time because he got such a kick from shaking his hair around. There was a lot of it. You don't grow. You don't get any bigger. Why don't you grow? I do too, just very slowly. Antony turned around, leaned on the plastic, and moved one toe at a time in the sand. I can't do that, watching me. You have to grow all the time. Not necessarily get bigger, but inside your head you have to grow, kid boy. For us human type people, that's what's important. And that kind of growing never stops. At least it shouldn't. You can grow, kid boy, or you can die. That's the choice you've got, and it goes on all your life. He looked back over his shoulder. Grow up. All the time. Even if they can't get out. Yeah. 
and I was uncomfortable all over again. I started pulling off my overalls for something to do, even if you can't get out. So that was uh, an excerpt from uh, The Star Pit, a radio play uh, that aired on WBI um, FM here in New York City uh, in 1967, the same year that uh, Chip's novel, The Star Pit, came out. And um, uh, what's, I guess, particularly interesting is that we have a soundtrack um, in, in, a, in a way in which you, we don't have in with audiobooks these days, except for these book track versions that you can get on Audible. So the flute that you're hearing is, was, was very much a part of, uh, of the original recording. But we basically heard the first um, eight pages of, uh, of, the, of the novel, which um, you know, it turned into 11 minutes of the play and it's sort of the prelude to the rest of the story. Um, uh, you know that that follows the protagonist Vaim from his uh, uh, sort of from his backstory on this planet to the star pit. So I'd love to uh, you know uh, start with you, Chip, and then and then come to you, Namwali, um, about company. But uh, what what ties this first part of the novel that we just heard with the rest of the novel? Okay, um, that's an endless question. Yeah, um, uh, I, I, um, uh, uh, Smaran. Uh, thank you very much for it. Um, the, if, we'll, if you will, will indulge me, I have a thought about uh, um, Namwale's reading, which I thought uh, was really interesting. Um, the, uh, the, the work she's covering, um, it's for, I, I'm just in the middle of listening to it, I realized I've got it in the other room, so I went running off to get it. And the first line of the of company is, a voice comes to one in the dark. Imagine, yeah, and then it goes on and it tells a story. And the story, what actually happens is very, in, in Beckett's story, is very, very different from what happens in Namwale's. And the last word in Beckett's uh, thing, which is about 20 pages long, uh, is, you know, the last word is alone. Uh, and it progresses between those two things. Um, the, um, what, what, um, what fascinated fascinated me is that the the original story has n almost no characters in it. It's one guy lying by himself on his back in the dark, you know, um, and he remembers a few things, but not very many. And it's mostly, uh, it's you know, it's 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 in um, a company is in what I think stories and text. One of the stories and text for nothing, um, but um, you seem you're, you're retelling the story as though not from the point of that guy, but from some. From from a from a whole there's a whole community that gets in, which in that sense is much closer to what I'm doing in the Star Pit, uh, and uh, it I thought that that itself was very interesting. Um, it just made me think of my own uh, exposure uh, to Beckett. I remember I was a great Beckett fan when I was a kid, uh, and I read the uh, uh, I read the. Uh, um, the, the trilogy was the first thing I read, and um, he came to New York at one particular time, and a friend of mine ran into him at the Cedar Street Bar down on 8th Street. So I went down uh, the next night because I wanted to meet this guy, and I because I'd already read three novels by him and a few uh, little things here and there, and I waited, and I waited. You'd think I was Godot, and he never showed up. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my Beckett story. Uh, but I like, I, I enjoyed the, uh, um, I wasn't sure um, when I read it before, when I read it by myself, I was wondering whether you thought of it, um, of this cover, as fundamentally a serious story or a comic story. Beckett's story is comic. Beckett's story is definitely Beckett is basically a comic writer, and I was one. And then listening to you read it, you read it very seriously, 
And so I'm wondering whether whether how you felt about that. So let me throw that back at you and ask you how you felt about that. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate that getting to talk to somebody who's who knows the novella well because most people don't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have it right here. Oh, that's I, wonderful, yeah. Although I, I I had it in the other room. I I hadn't reread it for the story. I I, yeah. I remembered I'd read it before and went running back to get it in the middle. Yeah. So I, you know, when I taught company in a graduate course on the phenomenology of reading in contemporary fiction, and I was looking at like, what is the experience of reading? And I was taking these graduate students through, you know, how would we interpret this text in a kind of analytical way? And then always sort of the turn towards the end of the conversation once we'd gotten through that was, well, how did it make you feel? And this was, I think, our first text in the class. And I said, so now that we've talked about what it all means and how we might interpret it allegorically and all this stuff, how did it make you feel? And three people said simultaneously, Nos nauseous. You know, <laughs> and, and, and so I actually think like I think that this well this, that that's where that's the source of the vomiting. Yes, exactly, exactly. And I think that the um I think that this story has and it has tenderness in it. These moments that are clearly about his mother, memories of his mother. Um, it has this kind of stripping down or existential kind of um, pulling away mm -hmm. of the body and this you know to, toward achieving like a kind of dark self with nothing else. And so I actually think it's of, of the books, um, it is one of the least comic, I think. I, I think it's like got moments of comedy when he's, he's trying to move, he's trying to get up. Um, and in my story, there's a whole episode that I didn't read out loud here where my unnamed narrator is training and he's going from being stuck in this crowd on the ground, um, this roiling mass of people to learning how to move his body. And I took just from Beckett this whole um, process of how do I move my hand? How do I get on my knees, et cetera? So there's this kind of like fundamental breaking down of the body into its uh, you know, component acts to how, how do you actually feel? And so there's, there's this moment of joy when my character runs for the first time, when he's gone back in time. And I wanted to capture that sense of, of freedom, like when you actually, uh, you know, burst forth. But I, I like this, uh, this question of the solitude that you're talking about, that's so inherent in, um, in Beckett's story, even though it's called company, right? And, yeah, so well, and company, company is what he, company is what the main character does not have. Exactly. Or so the story. Kind of, uh, and yeah. there's, when I was drawing my story, sort of drawing the shape of it, I had it sort of like narrowed down to like this very stark central scene where it's just the main character Lila and Pound who has infiltrated his way onto the time travel ship and it's this kind of triangle of, of three people and it gets more and more stark until it feels like they're all alone even, they're all, even though they're all together. Um, so I was trying to access some of that as well. But I think what really was fascinating me and this appears in your story too, right, is how do you think about community? How do you think about the relationship between the singular, the, the smallest unit, and the, you know, in my story, the crowd, but in yours, you have this, you know, the the, the ecologarium as a kind of model for a community yes, that's yes, also exactly. happening on, on the planet. Do you want to talk more about your thinking about the self and and the, and the community? Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, I mean, the thing, this, again, it, uh, uh, community, of course, is what I, I most have always been mostly interested in as a writer, uh, and that that's true. But uh, the communities, uh, at least in science fiction, tend to be made up communities. They they model they model the way communities work as a distance. Um, on the one hand, you know, people live. You know, they have a whole beach that's been assigned to their family uh, in, on one planet. And then somebody blows the whole half the planet up and everybody is killed. So he has to go to another planet and things like that, which are things that you can only, you know, suggest in the, when you actually talk about the plot. And at the and then at the plot, um, the Star Pit is not a novel. I mean, for just in terms of genre, I mean, I, I, this is just this. I, I'm ad addressing this to Smarin. It's it's a it's a long story. It's notably longer than Company. Uh, it's a, a novella. I would say it's a novella. It's a not. It, well, it's a 
depending <laughs> the, 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 the definition of these things changes over the years. Uh, I believe it was nominated for a Hugo in the novelette category. Ah, novelette, I like uh, or, or a nebula, maybe, or maybe it wasn't. I don't remember what, but uh, it's, you know, it, 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 came, it, it appeared in a science fiction uh, no, a science fiction magazine called New Worlds, with about three other long stories and four other four or five short stories uh, back in um, '66, and then it was pulled out of that and done as a two-hour radio play, which about 98 percent of the text was actually used in the two hour radio play. So that the whole thing takes about two hours to read aloud. And there were little cuts that some of you could see them go by, the he says and she said, you know, if it was clear that a new character was speaking, um, there are only, I think, two or three other actors making all those other sounds and one musician, a uh, wonderful woman named Susan Schwears who made did the music. Um, uh, who was a good friend of mine at the time, and uh, but uh, so um, I, you know, but I, uh, I at the time when it was broadcast, I was living in a commune on Third Street <laughs> called Heavenly Breakfast, and the, everybody in the commune sat around and listened to it come out of the radio. It was on. It was a radio play. We didn't have a television back then, uh, and so all of this, of course, had to be imagined. And we all sat there. And one of the kids in it, whose name was Andy, at one point it was rather cold. There was no heat in the apartment, so the radio was warm. So he put his head on the radio uh, to get some warmth and went to sleep while everybody sat around and listened uh, <laughs> listened to the to the show, every, which was very nice. Was fun. Um, but as I said, community, you you. You, you, the communities are made up in my work, uh, so there, um, and I gather in your work too. I mean, this in this particular story, this is not a community, you know, that, that's real. But and it's not, and it's it, it's the lack of community that seems to be the, the 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 theme, if anything, of the Beckett story, which originally, you know, um, which was a thing that I think runs through a lot of Beckett that he never gets quite as close to the community as he wants, you know, the, the whole the trilogy, it's three different, three voices, which are rem of people who are remarkably isolated, you know, and who are remarkably set you know, what the earlier book is a little, yeah. but uh, uh, so. But, well, what I think is interesting is that that first sentence, which I love, I've quoted it in my criticism as well, a voice comes to one in the dark, imagine. Yeah captures sort of as a metafictional line it describes the workings of reading right when yeah. you're, you're you're by yourself and then a voice comes to you and in some very curious fashion the form of the story because it is a story is the company that he can't get as a person inside the story you know so the possibility of, of, of reading as this kind of communal relationship between people, um, mm -hmm. I do find really fascinating um, as well. I think, you know, one of my favorite characters in uh, the Star Pit um, is uh, you have, um, she has this capacity to, to see everything that's happening um, in someone else. Allegra. Aunt Allegra. Yeah. Um, and that, also feels to me like a kind of allegory of reading. I mean, I yep. think some people would see it as like hyper emp hyper empath, right? And which is yeah, she's, yeah. Yeah. Octavia is, is interest. Octavia Butler was also interested. Yeah, in. she's she she is kind. It, she does belong to a group of characters. Of I mean, the characters who have dealt with the, and the other character. It's interesting because the other character that um, who who does this in most famously is a black character. Uh, in uh, in Alfred Bester's uh, The Star is My Destination, Robin Weddensbury, who is an, a projective telepath, uh, who is a black woman teacher, who can, has, has, she's made particularly good at teaching because she can project directly into people's minds. Uh, and, uh, um, and and she 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 has an interesting uh, her story within that novel. But then we we talk we'd be talking about one of every a lot of people's, um, including mine's uh, um, nominee for you know possibly the greatest single science fiction story at least of the twentieth century science fiction novel 
of the 20th century written, written. Uh, and I first read it when I was about 14, but that's getting off on a, on a whole uh, thing. But I always thought it was interesting that there is a, a, that there's a, black char a black character and a black woman character at that is so important in that story. Uh, and there's also a redheaded character and an albino woman, yeah. uh, white woman character who turns out to be the real villain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But so do you do you feel like this um, idea of projecting or te telepathy is has is for you a kind of um, metaphor for the process of reading or writing? Telepathy for me is a fantasy. It's just a fantasy. It doesn't exist. And it's a tool. <laughs> it's a tool for, you know, it's a tool. Um, uh, you know, it's a tool for talking about things that don't exist. That's all. Well, I'm wondering, do you think it's because, you know, this idea that it's a black female, I think that this in, in Butler as well, the black female character is often privileged as having the sensitivity to what other people are thinking or feeling. Like I've that's just that, and that's just sex. That's just sex. sexism and racism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, it, and so this idea that it's about empathy. Right. I'm wondering if, if no, empathy is a good empathy is a good thing. But is it is telepathy for you? like more about that emotional projection or is it more about that kind of imaginative literally Imagine, yeah, it's more well, about the imaginative yeah 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 the point the point is i think there are an awful lot of there are an awful lot of very empathetic males <laughs> of course <laughs> um, well, I mean, my I mean, own my own partner is far more empathetic than i <laughs> well, for us to maybe talk about one thing that connects the two of your stories, um, which is uh, something that we don't hear in this excerpt, is the figure of the golden in, in the star pit. And in, in a certain way, the kind of time traveling melanin extractors that we see in company, um, you know, bear some similarities to this, uh, this sort of separate status or, or the way that y'all are both using, a, you know, a, a kind of... Uh, this trope of science fiction or speculation to, to do something with with uh, race, like in the in the case of the golden, uh, maybe you want to say more about it, Chip. But it's it's uh, these individuals who are the uh, the golden, like are the the only um, uh, uh, people who can do inter intergalactic travel, right? In the star pit. Yeah, well, of course. To talk about the goal of this, this, we're talking about something that we have no way of knowing if the audience has anything way to relate to whatsoever. Uh, and so, I wonder whether how useful that is, um, because it's, it's 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 kind of like changing the subject. Uh, but uh, um, yeah, they were they are the they are they are the they are the they are the privileged ones who can get out. They are the privileged ones who can do what the others can. Some of them are black, some of them are light colored, you know, I mean, and, and they are, they don't break up, but they don't break up uh, as, as to race. Uh, I dealt with them in the radio play and in the story. Uh, I make, I try to make pretty clear that they're, they are both black and, you know, they, they, their, their, their skin colors range all the way through various shades of melanin. Um, uh, one of the reasons that I, I did ask that one of the visuals be that early picture of me at uh, 26, because that's about the way I imagined what the, uh, the narrator of the story looking at the time. Yeah. Uh, so that's why that's why that particular visual was in. And I, you know, thanks, Rick. Thank you for uh, sticking that in. Uh, uh, who the man who did the, the, the video. Uh, so anyway, um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how to answer that without getting into, you know, something very complicated. Uh, how do you see your the two stories as connected, if if at all? Like, what do you think the overlaps are? Even if we I don't, don't see them as connected at all, I think them, I think they're two entirely different genres from two entirely entirely different t uh, times. Um, I don't have a um, mine was not mine was not a cover of any other stories. Uh, there was not, you know, um, I don't, uh, do you feel, um, uh, um, Namali, uh, um, Namali, that, that uh, you want your reader, you want readers who have read the original? Not necessarily. Not I mean, necessarily, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that, you know, it was an occasion, right? Um, the, this was part of an issue of McSweeney's, the San Francisco-based uh, literary journal, where they asked people to cover short stories. You oh, know, this was a request. 
Well, so I had already started writing my version of the story um, involving Pound and Lila and the narrator. And when I was, and, and I, I had already been including lines from company because it mapped onto the kind of tone of the story that I wanted. And when they asked me, I said, oh, well, I'm gonna do this systematically. And I went through company and pulled out all of the, the lines that I wanted to use to incorporate into my, into my story. But my, my hope, I mean, it's, it is, I think, an unusual piece stylistically because it combines uh, a modernist, you know, short story by Beckett with a kind of Black science fiction sensibility. And um, I think the language maybe gets in the way um, to a certain extent. There's a kind of like uh, overlay of poetry with the um with the, the more basic facts of time travel and so on and so forth but yeah. in some sense i think that's probably one of the connections i see with with your work is that you're unafraid to be poetic you're unafraid to to you know actually really care about language um yeah. the plot is not as as um i mean the plot is important but the plot is you know at at the service of the language rather than the other way around mm -hmm. um and the other thing that I, that, I mean, I, I noticed actually it was very interesting that, you know, the sloths are, are you know, expiring in the sun, the way that my white character is at the beginning. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's a, that's a, that's a funny coincidence. But actually, w one of the connections I saw actually has to do with this question of race and gender, as I think for both of us, um, race and gender are not fixed identities, but are like things that emerge in relation between people. Um, so, you know, one of the most uh, striking things about your story, which I talked to students about, and again, this is leaping to a part of the story that we, the audience hasn't read, but there's a, a relationship between the main character, Vime and Pulaski. Who yes. described as um, just as Pulaski, <laughs> and Pulaski, they worked Pulaski. <laughs> Pulaski. and they, yeah. they, they work together. Um, and there's but there's a kind of uh, sexual tension dynamic happening yes. between the two. And then and he feels kind of disgusted by Palachki. And then we learn that Palachki is in fact a woman. Yes. And, yes. and my students never ever imagine that someone named Palachki, who is like the person who works with Vime, is a woman until that gets revealed. Right, which one of what that, what, that was a big problem with the recording. Casting, oh, yes, because, wow. because we, we have a, we had, we got a woman who had a, had a, a Phoebe Ray, who had a very, had a very deep, deep voice, which we were hoping might be ambiguous. But when, once we recorded it and said, no, nobody is, as soon as she opens her mouth, <sighs> you know, rhyme, you know, she, yeah. You, you know that it's a woman, so that what that's one thing that, that that's a uh, that was a reveal that was entirely textual, and as soon as it became or you know as soon as it became oral, that vanished from the story, and I, I it's the thing one of the things I I most miss. It's uh, so interesting. It's interesting that you should bring that up, uh, because if, when you do read the story, that is a big. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, I mean, one of the things I love about what you just said is that I my argument to my students was that this ambiguity could only happen in text, mm. that if you had a film, it would be very hard to have a visual image of someone androgynous enough that we wouldn't ascribe a gender to them. Yeah, one of the one of again, just one of the auxiliary stories. Um, the line where it becomes clear is that what was in the in the writ, final written version, which you can read not in the magazine, but you can read in my collected stories today. Um, he says he says to he says to her, um, um, you know, you're a great great friend. He said, "You're fun in bed," is the line, but I don't want to get married with you. Right. Yeah, you know, um, when um, when the story was published in New Worlds, um, Fred Pohl cut out your fun in bed. It was too confusing. Uh, yeah, so, so, so I went in, I was furious. Yeah. Because I thought it was, it's got to be clear that these two have been sleeping with other, it's, a, it's about, yeah. a, it's about joining up. It's not about sex. It's not about, yeah. 
And so I went in with a letter explaining that, you know, um, I, as far as I was concerned, he could drop the entire story from the magazine is for, you know, because you've taken out the most important part of the thing and a very nice, very, very smart young woman who happened to be a dwarf, uh, who was his, his secretary, Judy Lynn Benjamin. I brought this letter in and I, uh, I gave it to her and she read it. And she decided Fred doesn't need this. And so she <laughs> threw it in the garbage. So the story did get published. It did get printed. If it had printed, it would never have been the radio play. Oh, interesting. So, so yeah. in the long run, it was good that the original got printed where we put the line back. The, it, the line yeah. is in the radio play. Yeah. Uh, it's in the printed version. But uh, Judy saved me a lot of... <laughs> Well, so this is so funny because I was going to analogize this moment where of, it's, of, it's interesting. It fascinates me that you've gone to the absolute center of much, yeah. you know, the, around the story. You know, go on. I'll let yeah, me... No, no. Well, I I was gonna. I was raising it because of this question of of gender emerging through relation rather than as something you ascribe immediately, and as literature and the text as a place where you can like sit in that ambiguity for a while. Whereas yeah. I can say the sound of a voice or the vision of somebody's um, you know, phenotype is going to be leading one way or the other. And right. what's, what's really interesting to me is that I almost pulled my story <laughs> because at the beginning of the story, you know, when uh, my main character's great grandmother and her sister are sitting by the swimming pool and then the brightening comes and then people are running for the, and I say something like, you know, all the white people are, are suffering from the sun coming closer, but the black people are, you know, they're blistering, but it's not quite as bad because their melanin is protecting them. And in the comments, the editor wrote, I was under the impression that these characters were white. Um, you, need to, you need to like say that they're black sooner. And I said, well, the whole point of this moment is that it races emerging through dynamic relation and also different responses to the environment. It's not like, I don't actually need to, but it was the default position for a character in a science fiction story was a white character. Mm -hmm. And I was being asked to mark them, you know, in terms of their race. Right. And I almost pulled the story because of this insistence. I was like, no, I don't want to, I want to maintain the ambiguity that the text allows, which yeah. is very similar to what you're doing with gender. So that's, that's yeah. a very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and I, of course, I, um, that that reminds me of something that happened to me with a with a with not with a science fiction novel, but with a non science fiction novel that I was trying to sell at that time, where I showed this very long uh, novel, um, which was about um, which was about some kids starts off about some kids, and on page twelve, it you find out that the kids the, all the kids are black of this. Yeah. You know, 100 page manuscript and the editor the white editor just she said i got to page 12 and i realized that these were all black kids and i just realized thought you're not very you're not a very serious writer because you didn't identify this on page one you know so that was you know, <laughs> you, know uh, you know i don't care what color you are you know i, I don't know yeah, yeah. But, as, but as far as he was concerned if you, you know if it was going to be about black people that had to be marked on page one yeah and um, so. no, I mean, and the thing is, it's like I, I understand that these are the conventions and expectations of readers. And one of the things I like to do is to play with those. Expectations. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And, and people do. And people have been doing that from time and, you know, what Shakespeare other than playing with the convention that half of his women were men. Exactly. You know, actors were actors were men playing women. So. Yeah. You know, you have all the, the you know, the, 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 you know, um, um, you know who, but who is Sylvia? What is she? Exactly. Swain's commander, uh, and things like that, you know. In yeah. the, in I'm, the, I'm teaching this, um, I'm teaching a class on black science fiction now, which I've taught before, and in which I'm teaching the Star Pit and uh, Babel 17. And um, one thing that I, I notice in teaching older science fiction texts by white authors that are about race or want to deal with race is how 
this dynamic understanding of race as something and gender as something that emerges through relation or through action is really like missing from these early white science fiction texts. They're much more focused on identity and essential essential identities. And when we get to, you know, it's just, it's in the sixties, you have these wild sort of imaginative um, descriptions of communities that are so much more far thinking, or, or, you know, it's, like, it's this weird thing that it's like in Blade Runner, it's like you get to the future and there's still just like rampant misogyny. And it's like, well, what, are we not really capable of imagining beyond these identity positions? Generally speaking, the answer is no. <laughs> no, we're, we're not. Um, most people today, when they talk about science fiction, what they're talking about is movies. They're not talking about written science fiction. You know, yeah. Most of the science fiction we have seen, you know, and most of the movies we have seen since Star Wars uh, have been science fiction. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No. And you know, we you 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 know, um, uh, I again, I think it's I, um, the I've always thought that it is important what genre yeah. the the piece belongs to. You know, whether it is a novel, a novel, a novelette. Uh, is it was it published originally in a magazine? Was it published originally in a book? Uh, um, uh, I just don't know. I know I, I still have all, a few of my old um, Beckett things. And then I have the hard that hardcover Beckett thing, that would, which I happen to have in the other room, which yeah. had made it. I have no idea how that was originally published, what magazine it was mm -hmm. originally in and whether it was. Did it appear in a, in a journal? Was the journal a you know, magazine? You know, it, and it is important. It isn't. Those things are important. It's it's um, it's combined with his other late work. Um, these are both from 1980. Um, company, um, and it's combined with his, another late work, Know How On, um, mm. which uh, is also a really bleak kind of stripping away of a of a human what, body. Something in Bottega Obscura or something like that. When when what's one of I think one of the journals that he. I vaguely remember. That was possible. But it's, yeah. it's, I think in Know How On is where we get the, the, the famous phrase that people have in, uh, in Silicon Valley have now a, a, a appropriated, which is the try, try again, fail, fail better. Right, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. It goes up your story as fall better, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're, he's trying to get up <laughs> and he's trying to. <laughs> He's trying to learn how to use his body that has been um, in this kind of state of uh, paralysis for most of his of his upbringing. Yeah, no, I mean, I think um, the, the the context in which these things emerge is is always fascinating. I, I also feel like there is, as you say, when you adapt something from one medium to another, there is a real there's a remarkable difference in what um, the receiver, the audience, actually can see or imagine um, as possible. And I, 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 I wonder, have you had any of your, of your texts adapted for television or, or film? Um, the Star Pit is the closest I've come. I, uh, um, it was, you know, the Star Pit is a radio play. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was broadcast, man, probably as many, I once figured it out, about 30 million people over a period of 12 years must have heard that over the radio. Um, but because it was radio and only the visual media, you know, come to, nobody nobody ever wanted to do it as a, as a film. I'm still, nobody's ever made a film of anything of mine. Uh, that's still, fascinating to me because I mean, and, and I think they're starting to make uh, films of Octavia's works now. There's a- Oh yes, well, it's, it's yeah. amazing what a MacArthur will do. Yes, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah, she was, you know, you know, she was a student of mine. I do, I do. Yeah, but what's yeah. interesting about that for me is that, um, well, you know, there is a long history of science fiction and the radio play, right? War of the Worlds, very famous. I'm sure, yes. Right? The, 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 um, yes. But, but, so I was coming at the end of that genre. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I may have well, been but, but now that genre is back because now we have podcasts. Yes, right. <laughs> so, but it does seem to me that we have a, an, an interesting discrepancy. If, if, as you say, a lot of the science fiction most people view now is in the movies. Yeah. It's very interesting that the the genre of black science fiction, you know, if, if we can think about black authors of science fiction, um, you and Octavia most famously, but you also have George Schuyler um, with Black No More. There's um, 
uh, Pauline Hopkins yeah. from the 19th yeah. century. And I, I've been finding more and more, I just found a book from 1905 um, by uh, self-published by a, a black man named Robert Gilbert Wells called Anthony. Oh, that, that I don't know. Well, it's, it's, there's, about only, that. there's only 22 extant copies of it and it has time travel and invisibility and it also has a, a moment where he turns his former master black with a potion um, shades, shades of Skylar <laughs> exactly and <laughs> so we have this we actually do have a tradition of, of black science fiction but that, that 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 it's so infrequently adapted do you think that's just a matter of as you say not enough MacArthur's or do you think there's actually something about the genre that's resistant to well the genre you the genres themselves are very are very jealous of their own borders. The reason they're the film people go to other film people when they look for subjects. They don't go to they don't cross the genre. Oh, this would make a you know a good genre of that. Um, that one of the that's one of the reasons there's you know the, um, the that there are so few uh, written science fiction. Mm. There are one there are lots and lots of wonderful written science fiction from the you know from the 40s, 50s, 60s. 70s and yeah. nobody is ever you know dune is perhaps which is by one of the clumsiest writers in the world <laughs> you know? uh, and it's an unreadable book and it was just very very lucky um it's the same thing the same thing with philip dick you know and uh, you know and blade and blade runner um you know a, a very good filmmaker uh, who who got a hold of a, a, a you know of a really second rate book, you know, <laughs> Roy's Dream of the Electric Sheep, and made it into a watchable film. What's interesting about that, that's another movie uh, that I feel like the adaptation, uh, I think the novel is a comic novel. It's very funny. Yes, yeah, so for what? Yeah, Phil, yes, Phil. Yeah. It's, a, it's a satire, right? And so, but it gets changed into this like moody, noir, you know, futuristic thing. And uh, yeah, I find it, I do think, I do think it's not just that, you know, um, the film people only go to the film people though. I do think there's something about science fiction that resists adaptation to, like written science fiction that resists adaptation to the visual medium. Nothing about it, it nothing, about, I'll, I'll, let me argue with you there. Okay. It's nothing about the genre itself. It's about the boundaries that hold the genre in. That's a very different thing. They don't, they go, they, they would rather, they would rather, film people would rather remake a bad science fiction film than they would, you know, and, and bring it up to date either with or without the title than they would to go to a written work. I think the difficulty yeah. lies in like what gets conjured right Absolutely. a voice comes to one in the in in the dark imagine right so when i'm when i'm picturing say um the aliens in octavia butler's uh dawn right which look a little bit like who like right they have a face covered in tentacles right and this is like the, i'm referring to the hp lovecraft story and the yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um it's very hard to actually adapt that into a visual medium and have it not look silly you know, and you need to until, like so, until somebody until a great special effects person does it. I and, hope so. Oh, why didn't we do this? You know, and it, I, mean, it, I, think it, I think it's a problem of monsters in general, like doing monsters yeah. is difficult, but like it's very hard to capture the the, the haptic, the physical. Um, your work does a lot of things about desire. Right. But right. also about like when when, you know, Allegra projects the world, it's not just visual. It's also like you also feel everything that yeah. she is thinking and, and so on. And so there's this and I, the nausea that I talk about in my story that I'm picking from Beckett, evoking that in a, in a visual medium, I think is kind of hard. Yeah. I did. True. True. Very true. I don't know, but, but maybe, maybe, maybe there'll be some brave filmmaker who will who will who will make the star pit. Or who knows? They, they they may even make company. <laughs> about the Genesis, though, about Dawn, it's Eva DuVernay who's turning it into a, a, a sci-fi TV series. So it'll be interesting to see who she leans on, who she brings in to do the special effects and how they represent the Oan Kali. I'm also very interested whether she'll do the sex scenes with the Oan Kali because they have like these elephant trunks and all sorts of, you know, there's all these crazy sex scenes. Whenever I teach this class, the students start off being 
um, really disgusted by the the aliens in that book. But then halfway through, they realize that they've now they're so fully enmeshed in that world that they feel the desire that she feels. It's it's a very it's an, an interesting process that takes place over the course of reading. I'd be very curious to see how they manage that on the screen. Mm -hmm. So uh, one uh, one thing that you mentioned is desire. In I know it's in the second half of your story that um, you know everyone's welcome to go out and read company, but in the second half you have a shift of desire amongst the characters um, on the time travel ship as well. Um, is uh, could you could you say more about that? Well, it's as I said, I sort of come to this very stark triangle between these um, these three people that are on the ship, um, and Pound is essentially. Um, raping Lila um, during this, this kind of harrowing period on the ship, trying to convince her to give him the codes so that he can make the ship work. And um, our, our main character who has had has sort of desire for Lila throughout the story is has to witness this and is also then pulled into it and is forced to engage in it. So desire becomes very complex and also kind of um, dark, I would say, uh, in that part of, of the text. Uh, it's definitely not the kind of um, free, free form and dynamic desire that we see at play in the star pit, where I think their desire is, is being presented as a way for a community to, to actually um, bond with each other, as opposed to as a form of violence. Would you say that's true, Chip? Yeah, well, I think I, I I don't know whether I can I, I um I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't I, I, I again I think it's a very complicated question. Whenever you get get a, get crossing boundaries about what you're going to do in film, what you're going to do in the others, what you're going to do in this TV series or what have you, I think you're uh, I think uh, genre boundaries, as I wrote a long time ago, are power boundaries. You know they are they are power boundaries and 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 usually um, they remain they are power boundaries and they remain power boundaries because most people don't know realize what they are they don't know what's involved in getting a piece from written to film uh, what's what what's good to get it what's involved in getting a a film to a TV search series or vice versa uh, and that's why the the boundaries remain so in, remain so in place. You know the, the changes in technology in fact affect them but affect them but by and large for most readers uh, on on all cases they're hidden yeah and you know while we sit discussing the word power works in silence uh, um, which is uh uko <laughs> Well, the, both of you were so, so grateful for this conversation. And I know that you have to go on to your next event trip. So I, I don't want to keep you here longer, but this has been extremely exciting. And we're really, really grateful that, um, you know, we were able to host you for this conversation. And yeah, keep writing and thank you so much. <laughs> okay. I don't think we can help it, Smarin. <laughs> oh, I may have stopped. It happens when you get around 80. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, you've given us a lot. <laughs> and you, it's been mutual. <laughs>